Let's play a game. Two truths and one lie. I tell you two things about yourself that are true and one that is not. All you need to do is guess which one is not true. The first thing you could see in color when you were born. Second, you can't taste anything if your tongue is dry. Third, you drank your own urine. Who thinks they could see in color when they were born? That's not true. <laughs> because human infants can't see in color until about five months of age. What is true is that you can't taste anything if your tongue is dry and you drank your own urine. Now, before you freak out, let me tell you how. <laughs> As medical research has found out, the human fetus floats in the amniotic fluid. That is 75% pure urine. As a child in your mother's womb, you not only did drink your urine, but literally breathed urine into your lungs for long periods of time, without which your lungs would not have developed. We were born in our own urine. Our urine gave us life. And some people continue to use that even after they are born. The use of urine, either taken internally by drinking or by application on the surface of the skin, is known as urine therapy. People practice it all over the world to treat any physical condition or just to promote good health. Most people, however, are disgusted by the thought <laughs> of using their own urine. It is interesting that how we reserve our worst negative attitudes towards our own biological substances like sweat, semen, fingernails, menstrual discharge, and no speakings. <laughs> In fact, it is also interesting to see that our attitudes are either neutral or positive towards these substances until the moment they are cast off from our bodies when they undergo a drastic role transformation. Children, however, don't find that disgusting. When I was about eight years old, we had these long wooden benches in school shared by two students. The girl beside me had this curious habit of bringing the stuff out from her nose and become curious as to how they would taste. <laughs> so she would put them in her mouth. At other times, she would be very generous and offer them to me. <laughs> I must say it was a very tempting offer. However, I refused. Children are found to be very accepting of their biological substance and often find them pleasurable. This accepting behavior is, however, changed by the society and education to its opposite of disgust and depreciation. The first time I heard about the use of urine was when I was a child, and it was from my family, who are perhaps as strange as any child. It happened when I cut my leg while playing one day, and everyone in my family came up to me and told me which doctor I should go to or which medicine I should apply on that. But my uncle came to me and calmly told me, the next time you cut yourself, just go and pee on it. <laughs> my 10-year-old self thought, that is the kind of advice I like. <laughs> However, I never did anything about it, because I thought using my own urine would do me more harm than if I did nothing. I jumped to a conclusion that my urine was harmful. What I was doing is what psychologists call fast thinking, where we jump to conclusions. An example of fast thinking can be found in language. Let's see how you read this. Even though the letters are 50% covered, you might be reading urine is good. Uh, I hope you got that right, because this is what it actually says. <laughs> This is an example of fast thinking where we jump to conclusions based on our experiences, biases, and preferences. It is very different from the slow mode of thinking that happens when we sit down with a pen and paper to analyze a complex problem. There are huge benefits to both kinds of thinking. The problem, however, really happens when we use fast thinking, when slow thinking would have been more appropriate. As I grew up, I decided to do some slow thinking about the advice my uncle had given me on the use of urine, and really asked myself, how can knowing this be helpful to me? TEDx Albany organizers, speakers, and everyone in the audience, 
throughout this talk, I invite you to ask the same question to yourself. How can knowing this be helpful to you? Many people have found out that when they apply their own urine to insect bites and stings, they are able to get immediate relief from the pain. They have also found that applying urine to heal cuts and wounds due to the urea content in urine is very helpful. If you were in a tropical country and you got dehydrated due to the high humidity, you would be given a drink of your own urine as a quick tonic, quite logically, to replenish the salts and water that was lost due to high humidity. My friend Corey was able to lose 40 pounds of weight by injecting himself with HCG shots that are made from the urine of pregnant women. So what is urine really? An article in the New York State Journal of Medicine stated that our urine is a derivative of the blood. Whatever it is found in our blood and our diet is also found in urine. Our urines are formed by a teamwork between the liver and the kidneys. Whatever we eat or drink goes into our intestines and is broken down into small nutrients and is sent into our bloodstream. This bloodstream travels through the hepatic portal vein into our liver. The liver, which is the heaviest organ in our body, is the powerhouse of our body. It breaks down those nutrients into smaller forms of energy that the body can use and sends them out into the body and stores some of it. Whatever we eat, however, is not useful for the body. The liver takes them out of the blood and excretes them in the form of solid waste or poop. The blood leaving the liver is considered to be clean. The liver, however, does not regulate the amount of nutrients that go out into the body. That is done by our kidneys. If you look closely at our kidneys, it is made up of millions of tiny units known as nephrons, where the real business of pee making happens. Each nephron has a glomerular sac where a process of filtration happens, where the nutrients are taken out of our blood. These nutrients then travel down the proximal convoluted tubule and into the loop of Henle, where a process of reabsorption happens. In this process, the kidneys decide what are the nutrients our bodies need now and reabsorbs them back into the bloodstream. The remaining nutrients then travel down the distal convoluted tubule into the collecting duct and into our urinary bladder and is secreted when the time is right. The kidneys are not taking out those nutrients because they are poisonous or bad for our bodies, but simply because our bodies don't need it at that point of time. The idea that our urine contains poisonous elements is merely a myth and not proven by facts. Our urine contains 95% water, 2% urea, and the rest is other medically important elements like growth hormones, insulin, and urokinase. Urokinase is an element that is useful for dissolving clots in our arteries and veins that can lead to heart attacks and strokes. How can knowing this be helpful to you? It was helpful for a company called Enzymes of America in 1988 when they discovered that urine has urokinase. And they realized that people were flushing down potential medicine down the drain. So they designed a filter that could collect that urokinase from 10,000 men's urinals around the country. And were able to tap into a medicine industry worth $500 million a year. In August 1993, Forbes magazine published an article about Fabio Bertanelli, who owned the largest fertility drug producing company in the world. The drug, Pregnanol, that improves the chances of conception, was made from the urine of postmenopausal women. In fact, in Tibet, a cure for infertility requires couples to drink each other's urine. Why didn't I know all of this? It was never a secret, because if you do a search on Amazon, you'll be find dozens of books on the subject of urine therapy, and a number of research papers in reputed medical journals on the use of urine. In fact, ancient records from Egypt, India, and China refer to the use of urine therapy. Between 1996 and 2013, there were six world conferences held around the world, attended by people of over 50 countries on the subject of urine therapy. 
I didn't know any of this because I never knew, made an effort to know it. About two months ago, one of my friends came to visit me and I told him that I was experimenting with you in therapy. He looked at the glass of water I had given him <laughs> and he freaked out. He asked me, am I a part of your experiment? I told him, I would love to give you my urine, but it works better if you use your own. He told me, what rubbish. If humans were supposed to drink their own urine, they would have had the natural instinct to do so. I told him, humans also don't have the natural instinct to practice meditation or to do regular exercise, which is clearly conducive to good health. Interestingly, humans don't question their natural instincts when they are imbibing strong liquors or smoking hundreds of cigarettes. <laughs> Instead, anyone who has done some farming or gardening should have realized that when dead leaves are dug back into the soil, the resultant fruits are sweeter, the flowers are more fragrant, and the trees are healthier. The dead leaves that seem useless are not they far from useless? Can the same principle be applied to the human body? After doing some research, I found out that urine therapy is a little more complicated than just putting dead leaves back into the soil. Firstly, because I could not use any urine. It had to be the first urination of the morning. Because our first urination contains medically important substances that are produced when we sleep. Secondly, I could not practice urine therapy if I was having a lot of acidic foods or animal proteins or on any medications. Thirdly, I had to capture the midstream of the first morning urination. <laughs> because the first stream and the ending stream can contain sediments. So every morning, I used to get a cup, go to the bathroom, and guess, OK, this is the midstream coming. <laughs> Then I would capture that and really ask myself, how can this help me? I definitely had a problem with dandruff. That happens when our scalps get dry. So I started massaging urine onto my scalp. I must tell you the biggest concern I had was I would stink. However, I found out that when urine is massaged and completely absorbed into the skin, it does not stink at all. After about two weeks of trying that, I found my dandruff to disappear. And I told my friends, I have cured my dandruff. <laughs> they told me, you must be using a very good shampoo. I told them, it's not only good, it's free. <laughs> Urine is able to cure dandruff because of its moisturizing properties. In 1992, a study was done at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark that found out that the urea in urine is a more effective moisturizer than most commercial oil-based moisturizers like Nivea. What I really wanted to know, however, was if drinking my urine would help me. I thought that I had to be a hero to drink my own urine. The first time I drank my urine, I didn't know if it was helping me. However, what I did know is that it tasted somehow bitter and salty. So I decided to add some flavoring to it. <laughs> Every morning I would cut a piece of lemon, <laughs> take it to the bathroom and squeeze it into a cup of urine and drink it. My roommates noticed that I was taking a piece of lemon to the bathroom every day. <laughs> they asked me, what do you do with this piece of lemon? I didn't think that they would like my answer. So I told them I scrub my nose with it. I don't think they believe that. After about two months of drinking my own urine, I got used to the taste, and after that, I could drink it neat. I realized the taste of my urine really depended on the kind of food I was having. If I was having acidic foods, a lot of animal proteins or spices, it did not taste as nice. But if I, I was having a lot of fruits and water, it tasted good. Urine tasted almost like water if I was fasting on just urine and water. So how did it help me? 
In a physiological and psychological sense, looking closely and slowly thinking about perhaps the weirdest and strangest part of myself left me feeling more fearless and I appreciated myself more. It created profound changes in me as to what I really am and everything that surrounds me. If you're ever thinking about practicing urine therapy, do not do it if you're having animal protein or using uh, medications. It is preferable that you take the advice of a trained urine therapist. People like that exist. When my uncle first came to me and told me to pee on my wound when I cut myself, I jumped to a conclusion and thought that my urine would do me harm. After doing some slow thinking and research about it, I found out that our urines actually have medicinal, antiseptic, and moisturizing properties. I hope after listening to this idea about your urine, instead of freaking out, you would really ask yourself, how can this be helpful to me? Thank you. <laughs>